Hey everybody, for this week's Select, I've chosen our 2019 episode on trick-or-treating. It's a really in-depth look at trick-or-treating, and it's got a lot of surprising stuff inside. Like, it turns out that if you don't set abandoned buildings on fire on Halloween, then you've been trick-or-treating all wrong all this time. But don't worry, we're releasing this just in time for you to learn the ropes this Halloween. Happy and extremely safe Halloween, everybody. Welcome to Stuff You Should Know, a production of iHeartRadio. Hey, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Josh Clark, and there's Charles W. Chuck Bryan over there, and there's Jerry, and this is Stuff You Should Know, the right before Halloween edition. About trick or treating. <laughs> you get like a little kid every Halloween. I'm pretty excited about it. Do yeah. You, do you get trick or treaters? No, not really. No. Condo life, hashtag, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, and I've told my story before, but uh, I'll just briefly summarize again that my house is after a big curve in the road, mm-hmm. and people seem to just stop at that curve in the road. Well, they don't want to come up on old man Bryant's house. No. You know, the <laughs> old dead oak tree with the big <laughs> hole in it that yeah. Boo Radley hides <laughs> figures in is kind of off-putting. It's right on your property. And I think uh, in my neighborhood, too, they close. They literally close off. The cops close off two blocks. Uh, there's just this big square uh-huh. of streets, and that's the official sanctioned no stress area where the parents all just walk around and get drunk Mm -hmm. and all the kids just run around and don't have to worry about cars. Right. So um, everyone in my neighborhood is congregated there. And you're outside of the the comfort zone? zone? Yeah, which I kind of miss. Like, I I like trick-or-treaters coming to my house. I I guess I could maybe try and, well, I could move a few houses in, which I'm not going to do. You could casually move the the roadblocks are a little further back to include your house. Well, they're actual police cars with police officers. Oh, I can't move them. Give them, give them some toys. But I could put signs that like, you know, this way for the best yet. And then you're like, only two more houses. <laughs> right. Or like leave a trail of candy. <laughs> Cause I remember when I first moved to Atlanta, we rented a house that got a lot of trick or treaters and I loved it, man. I scared it the heck out of those kids. Oh really? Yeah. It was a lot of fun. Like it, I really got, that was my first big adult giving out candy night, like the first time I've ever been able to do that Uh because we didn't have kids yet, so we weren't out Mm -hmm. trick-or-treating. Sure. And, uh, yeah, I made it – I really – I pumped music out, like the psycho theme and scary John Carpenter stuff. Sure. I really enjoyed it. Did you, like, do anything to overtly scare them? Oh, yes. I wore a – I was dressed up as a a very scary person. Uh Uh-huh. And I would jump out and scare them over and over and over. Did you really jump out? Mm Mm-hmm. Good for you, Chuck. Or I would stand in the, like, Emily would be giving out candy, and I would just be in the darkened house, like, eight feet behind her, just standing there motionless. That's always a nice (laughs) tack. (laughs) Nice. (laughs) But the point is, I I sort of feel like we're missing out. Like, we certainly enjoy taking our daughter out, but I really wish we had kids that came by. Yeah, I wish you did too, Chuck. It's too bad. Yeah. A stupid house right there near the main road. So close, yet so far away. So far away. <laughs> yeah. And that's your forever house, too, huh? Yeah. No I'm, trick-or-treaters I'm, ever again for you. I'm locked in there. But what we could do is, you know, we could go to a friend's house and... That doesn't count. Then you have to, Jump like, on their coattails. You can't sit on their couch. You have to take your shoes off in their house. You can't be comfortable. <laughs> We've long talked, me and my friend uh, Eddie and Allison, you know them, about... They have a good backyard about doing like a haunted trail one year. Uh-huh. That like if you come trick or treating, you got to go through the trail first. It sounds like a lot of work. It is, and it would be fun. No, I mean for the kids. Yeah. Who have to go through the trail? Got to earn. <laughs> right, you got to earn that free candy. <laughs> earn that Reese's pieces. So we just hit upon like fifteen different themes in this episode. Mm-hmm. If you'll, if you'll agree. Do you agree? Yes. Um, so we're talking about trick or treating here. And it, if you look at the thing on its face, just the words, trick or treat, mm-hmm. there seems to be some sort of option here. You can do one or the other. There used to be. Give me a treat <laughs> or you get a trick, basically, was the equation. Yeah, they should just change the name now to just treat night. Treat night, right, exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, th- we aren't 100% sure on where trick or treating came from, but what we do know is that it was originated in America in the 20th century, and that there was this, like, brief golden age 
where it lived up to its name, trick or treat. There was a there was an offer to not get pranked or tricked. And if you didn't take the people up on the offer, the kids up on the offer by giving them candy, mm-hmm. you got pranked. That was the equation. It was in the name. Everybody knew the score. And then it slowly kind of moved over to what we understand today where the police set up roadblocks and everything is safe. These kids these days. And it's just kind of, just like you said, just the treat side of the equation. Yeah, I was, of course, kidding, but we'll get to it. There are people that really do decry this new generation of children who just expect handouts and that it (laughs) leads to the idea of the welfare state right? and all this other garbage that I have no patience for. Sure. Because it's just a fun thing for kids. Yeah. Or do you think they should be earning the stuff? No, no, no. I don't feel that way. I I do feel, well, I think it'll come through loud and clear as we do the episode. All right. Well, we should jump back a little bit to the origins of Halloween. We've gone over this before in episodes past, but we all know it originally started as a pagan harvest, or not just one, but pagan harvest festivals in general among the Celts over in the UK. Yes. And uh, that evolved into Halloween, but it had nothing to do with trick-or-treating at the time. No, it wasn't around. Again, trick-or-treating is a 100% American invention. That's right. Um, And so with Halloween in particular, uh, you've got all these different components for the modern Halloween or for trick-or-treating. Yes. You have going from house to house. You have getting to said house and asking for a treat, Mm -hmm. basically sanctioned begging. Got your costume. Costume, dressing up. Um, Got being outside, kind of parading around. All of these things find their origin in the Celtic and I think specifically Gaelic um, harvest festivals that introduced the, the dark half of the year. That's right. And in particular, there was Samhain, which forever I've always said Samhain because that's how it's spelled. No, we, you said Samhain, right, when we did our Halloween episode, didn't you? Uh, probably. Yeah. By the way, speaking of Samhain or mm-hmm. Sam Hain, mm-hmm. <laughs> I, you realize that I went to New York and saw the Misfits on Saturday. Oh, yeah. How was that? I'm it sure was it was great. Colossally yeah. amazing. This is the original Misfits, right? The original Misfits. Glenn Danzig, yeah. Jerry Only, sure. Doyle Wolfgang von Frankenstein, yeah. who actually specifically invited us to yeah. this. Stuff you should know, listener, right? Yes. Yeah, um, to this uh, this show. And it was. That's amazing. Knock your socks off. Amazing. Didn't the Damned play as well? The Damned opened and then Rancid and then the Misfits just tore the roof off the sucker. I saw, when I saw you were going, I looked up some YouTube clips of this tour and it looked pretty amazing. It was amazing. And I think. Glenn Danzig said that was their last one ever. Oh, really? And so we got to see it. Wow. Yeah, you, me, and I went had a great time. Amazing. So big, big thanks to Doyle Wolfgang von Frankenstein for the invite. The, the stage setup looked great. It was it was just a really cool show, and they played almost everything. Yeah. Yeah, it was just a really good show. That's fantastic. So anyway, back to Samhain. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, that's a perfect mi- time to mention that show, though. It yeah. all worked out. It did. Um, Hallow's Eve was the uh, the night considered when the veil between the living and the dead was the shortest. Mm-hmm. And so that's when this uh, that's when Halloween formed. Right, right. So people would dress up uh, in like modern day Ireland, Scotland, I believe Wales, yeah, Wales Isle of Man. Um, they would dress up like demons or fairies or supernatural characters mm-hmm. who were um, because this veil was so thin between the living and the dead, or the supernatural, right? Um, they could cross over. These yes. creatures could cross over. And communicate. So if you dressed up like them, maybe they would be confused and think you're one of them and leave you alone. That's right. So this now we've got the costume thing going, right? That's right. And uh, part of that was the community getting together, uh, getting drunk on, you know, probably high-octane mead. mead and stuff like that. <laughs> And they would parade through the town. Uh, they saw Halloween parades all over the place. Right. Here in Atlanta, we have one of the best uh, in Little Five Points. The yeah. Halloween parade, fantastic. Like when you think about the Halloween parade at your town, like that is centuries, millennia old. Yeah. That tradition is. Yeah. So we have those two things going on. Mm-hmm. And then the one missing piece is knock, knock, hey, give me candy. Right. But this we have the origins of, which came, and it's still not Halloween. It took... American kids to put all this stuff together. Mm -hmm. But uh, the European tradition of souling, which was when kids on Hallow's Eve would go from house to house and pray for the souls of the departed. And in exchange, you would get a soul cake. 
<laughs> yeah, which I looked up. They look pretty good. <laughs> what is it? Just a little baked good? It looks like a muffin top, like top of the muffin to you. Ah. It looks really good. Soul cakes. Uh, or mumming, which is, and this sounds fantastic. I wish <laughs> kids still had to do this stuff. Yeah. Uh, you would have to perform a short uh, musical number or some kind of performance to get uh, a treat of some kind or right. maybe a little spare change. Right. So in that sense, you have going to house to house and getting something from the owners of the house, like a treat or something like that. That's right. But there was a reason for that, praying for the soul of their departed loved one, doing mm-hmm. a little dance number, something like that. The prank part, the prank part of the equation, that also existed before trick-or-treating too. And in fact, that was kind of the origin or the the biggest tradition of Halloween itself was pranking. Yeah, and that came from Ireland. Is that right? Yeah, supposedly in the 1880s, they would prank, they they would just run around doing pranks and then they would blame those fairies or demons on Samhain um, for the mischief. That it wasn't us, it was the fairies. On Sam Hine? (laughs) Right. I mean, it sounds, that's how it's spelled. Yeah, it's really, that's a confounding pronunciation. It is, but there you have it. That's right. Uh, and then pranks back then, and of course, were pretty low key, uh, ding dong ditch stuff like that. Um, moving the neighbor's furniture to the roof. I saw that. Yeah, not uh, like bad. flower pot on the chimney. Sure, but I, it would also get way, way worse than that. Yeah, I looked up uh, mischief night. We never did that in Georgia. No, or uh, Devil's Night. It was also called. Yeah, which is the night before Halloween when mm-hmm. all these pranks would happen. Um, region to region is called different. Apparently in uh, New Jersey, it's Mischief Night. Or Cabbage and, Night or something? Well, in Camden, New Jersey, it's Mischief Night. Other parts of New Jersey call it, call it Cabbage Night. Um, Cincinnati calls it Damage Night. <laughs> That's pretty overt. <laughs> That's a punk band name right there. <laughs> Damage Night? Yeah. Totally. That's insurance deductible night. Uh, other part, <laughs> I don't know why Ohio is so highly represented here. Beggar's Night is something else they called it in Ohio. Chuck, because there's nothing else to do in Ohio but sit around <laughs> and wait for that night. For Hallow's Eve. Uh, other names, Doorbell Night, Trick Night, Corn Night, Tic Tac Night, Goosey Night. And then in Canada, uh, Gate Night or Mat Night if you're in Quebec, because M-A-T. They would take, they would steal the gate off your fence or the mat from your doorstep and oh, really? remove it, yeah. Oh, okay. So they're pretty on the nose, especially Damage yeah. Night. But uh, Devil's Night in Detroit, uh, it became legendary over about a 20-year period mm-hmm. in the 70s and through the mid-90s, I right. saw, yeah. before they finally got a little bit of a, um, could put a dent in it by forming Angel's Night. Yeah, they kind of re rebranded it. Well, not rebranded. The Angels were volunteers who would walk around to keep kids from setting everything on fire. Oh, okay, because that's what they did on Devil's Night. It was a night of arson. It was a night of arson. I thought that it ran its course because they burned all the buildings down in Detroit <laughs> and there was nothing else left. It, it was a real problem, though. I looked into it, and, like, hundreds of kids, like, in 1994, I think there were, like, 315 kids arrested mm-hmm. uh, For on Devil's fires. Night. Fires and other stuff. In 1984, the peak of Devil's Night yeah. in Detroit— there were 810 cases of arson in That's one night amazing. in Detroit. Yeah. They would just set the city on fire. And I'm sure some of these were bags of poop on a doorstep. Right. Which I think we can all agree is harmless fun. It is, unless you're the <laughs> steppy. So, I never did any of this stuff. I never rolled a house. Oh, you didn't? No. Oh, that's I was, fun. Oh, I'm so mad. I was so busy being it's, good. It's never too late, buddy. I know. I should roll a house or yeah. fork a yard. I don't know what that is. The plastic forks. Just basically get like 2,000 plastic forks and stick them in the yard. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. I've never heard of that one. You never did that? I'm going to really chew up a lawnmower. I never egged a house because I always heard yeah, that that really damages like that. paint. Yeah. But we did have the junior-senior egg fight every year. That was kind of fun. Well, there you go. You got something Where you get on. together in a field and uh, throw eggs at each other. Aside from wasting a, a, a lot of precious eggs. resource <laughs> yeah. with, well, eggs, yes, but also um, toilet paper, you really should roll somebody's house at least once <laughs> in your life. It's great. Is it? Yeah. All right. Yeah. I'm going to roll your condo. <laughs> I remember when I was a kid, actually, uh, my friend and I rolled the neighbor's house, mm-hmm. but we had to be in early, so we were doing it basically in broad daylight. <laughs> it was dusk at best. Yeah. 
And a cop drove by, which never happened yeah. in our neighborhood, ever, never. Mm-hmm. The cops just weren't needed, right? It was just, I think we talked about in the free range episode, right. free range parents episode, you could just do whatever. And um, we had to knock out of the house of the neighbor whose house we just rolled to let us in to hide from the cop. Oh, and wow. she went out and told the cop, like, it's it's fine, don't worry about it. Holy but we rolled God. her house and had to get safe harbor from her. Yeah, and you can't really clean up a rolled house, can you? You can, but and you have to I have wait for the rain. if they come tell your parents what you did. How do you do you know, it? No, the rain makes it way worse. Yeah, but, I mean, you can't you climb just, up there, can you? Right. Some of it's inevitably stuck up there, but you can pull it down as, as gingerly as you can okay. to get as much as you can. But, no, some's going to be left over. All right. I'm going to roll a house. Okay. Just know whose house you're rolling. Like, you don't want to get shot at or anything like you, that. I don't see that anymore either. I feel like it – I mean, I don't live in the suburbs. Maybe it's a little more prone – to happen there. Yeah. But it seems like a lost art. <laughs> it very well maybe. I don't know, you know anybody who rolls. I just assumed it was because we'd outgrown it, you know? Emily called it TPing a house. Yeah. That's Ohio. Yeah. Yeah. TP. Ohio. All right. Let's take a break. <laughs> we're, we barely talked about this. I, I think we're one page in. Good. That's great. All right. So, to recap, Chuck, we have the costumes in play now. Mm -hmm. We have being out on Halloween night, sometimes parading drunkenly. Community. Um, We have going from house to house. Mm -hmm. And we have the prank factor. That's right. All of these things are out there floating around, have been out there for centuries, millennia, by the time America is born and makes it to the 20th century. Mm -hmm. And at some point, some kids said, we think, hey, you know what? We could pull all this together. And turn it into something really amazing mm-hmm. and peculiar and unique called trick-or-treating. That's right. You found a great piece uh, from a sociologist named Samira Kawash. Great name. Uh, called Gangsters, Pranksters, and Trick-or-Treating, 1930 to 1960. Yeah. And is this that pure period Yeah. that you were talking about where she thinks that American kids just— Created this thing? Yeah, there's two historical views because we don't know where it came from. Uh-huh. One historical view, and I think this is what Kawash believes too, is that it was actually kids who figured this out. Which is great. Who said we can extort adults to not prank them mm-hmm. if they give us treats. Right. And that it was a genuinely a kid a invention of kids. Mm-hmm. They made it up. Right. And um, there's some evidence for that kind of thing. A lot of like the early newspaper accounts of it kind of call the kids gangsters and say they're extorting people. It's also possible that it was like written super tongue in cheek. Right. And that that dry, it was kind of dry and lost to the ages. Yeah. The other historical view is that the kids were out pranking and doing the pranks and it was the adults that introduced treats into the equation to, to buy them, them off. Oh, okay. To, yeah. yeah, to keep them from pranking. Right. Uh, Los Angeles possibly as the point of origin. Mm-hmm. Um, and this one, uh, wealthy kids, I I guess that makes sense that this would be the idea of like kids of privilege. (laughs) Sure. You know, Uh like come around, give me stuff. (laughs) Uh, but apparently in Los Angeles, kids in the wealthy parts of town would dress up and their parents would take them around from house to house. And this is, um, this is that pre-1930 period though. Yeah. They think sometime in the twenties. And if you think about it, that really resembles what we do today. Yeah. But in between that origin and wh- where we've arrived today, there was this pure period, mm-hmm. from 1930 to 1960. Some people might even take it a little further beyond that, where the kids seem to have run the show, and um, there there really was both sides of the equation, a trick right. or a treat. Right. Uh, but that term actually was in 1927 in an article, right? Is that the first time they found... The, the two words in print together, yeah, right. or I guess three words. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was in an article about a town uh, called Blackie in Alberta, Canada. Yeah. And it seems like all of it was sort of on the West Coast early on. Yeah, and again, they think 
possibly it did originate in Los Angeles, or it may have originated in multiple towns on the West Coast roughly at the same time. But we're thinking 20s because in 1919, there was a book uh, by Ruth Edna called— Ruth Edna uh, Kelly. Uh, Ruth Edna Kelly called The Book of Halloween— uh, and it didn't mention any kind of trick or treating in there. No, and it's like an exhaustive, comprehensive homemaker's yeah, so overview. It would have been in there, right? For sure. And you got to think, like poor Ruth Edna Kelly's, like, gosh, if I just waited like two years <laughs> right. to put this book out, they're going to come up with something brand new with Halloween. I know. Two years after I come up with this book, <laughs> I wrote the book on it. Right. Not quite. Now it's out of date. Uh, but they did find mentions of it in newspapers uh, out west: Portland, uh, Washington, Reno, Nevada. Nevada, Helena, Montana. Yeah, and you can kind of track its progress from the dates and yeah, the mentions in these newspaper East. articles. Right, yeah. Um, so there's those two sides. One say that it was kids who came up with it on their own. Um, perhaps they were introduced with the idea of going from house to house to get treats mm -hmm. in Los Angeles. But then they said, well, we're also doing these prankings. Maybe we can say, hey, we won't prank you if you give us a treat. Right. There's that view. The other view, again, is that um, it was adults who said, whoa, kids, you know, we don't want you setting fires any longer, derailing streetcars, because every once in a while somebody would die. Yeah. People would get shot at by angry neighbors. Mm -hmm. um, Sometimes somebody would be in one of those buildings that they set on fire and they die. People mm -hmm. would die in a building that kids set on fire as a Halloween prank. So for the most part, though, it was just kind of um, tolerated as one night a year when the kids basically had power and, and were allowed to run the show. Um, so the, I, this idea, this other historical view that adults finally said, hey, you know, we're not going to just say you can't do pranking. That'd probably be a bad thing. But why don't we just... Start having parties on Halloween night while right. you're out pranking, and there'll be cider and donuts, and you can come inside and bob for apples, and maybe do that instead of running around pranking the neighborhood. And once you did do that, you went from, and this is um, Samira Kawash putting it, like you, under the r rules of society, you went from this powerful kid who could levy a prank on you if he or she wanted to, to a house guest of the adult who now had you in right. and had given you donuts and cider. Right. Are you really going to set their house on fire as a prank after that? Of course not. No, you're not going to. So in this sense, trick-or-treating was something the adults introduced to keep kids from c carrying out these pranks. Yeah, and it was by the time World War II came around, it was a big thing uh, in the 1940s. But, of course, uh, with the sugar rationing, and just the fact that there was World War II going on, yeah. it put a dent in it for a little while, but it came back um, bigger than it ever had been after the war. And I mean, seriously, it came very close to dying just out going from World War II. Sure. It was pretty new. It hadn't gained that much traction. There were a lot of cranks and grumps who were not happy about this kind of thing. I'm curious what else had died in the war and never came back. Mm -hmm. There's got to be lots of little things. That's a great question. We should know? look it up. Yeah. Uh, but there were a couple of big uh, pop culture um, sort of tent poles that helped Halloween along. Uh, Charles Schultz's Peanuts, of course. Yeah. It wasn't the Great Pumpkin Charlie Brown yet. And that was the 60s, I think. Yeah, but in 1951, he uh, had a four-day um, comic strip run around Halloween where the Peanuts gang got all ready and got their costumes going. Mm -hmm. And that really brought it to the forefront. Uh, and then Donald Duck, uh, it was a cartoon, Donald Duck Trick or Treat, a year after that, that had Donald working with his nephews, uh, or trying to prank his nephews while they were trick or treating. Right. And working with the witch. And then the candy companies get involved. There was also a, a very famous costume company called Ben Cooper Costumes. Yeah, are they the ones no who did, way. like, the cheap... Yes, uh, plastic mask uh -huh. and, like, a vinyl smock. <laughs> That's right. But they, they had this really great talent of identifying what was going to be, like, right. a pop culture phenomenon before the, it ever blew up. Yeah, so they get the, the rights be? for cheap. Yeah. But they were also making these things, like, 10 months before. Yeah. So they really had to have foresight, and they were really good at it. But the fact that you could get cheap, amazing costumes that the little kids all wanted of their favorite characters, yeah. that definitely helped things along, too. Yeah, it was. It's hard to overstate like how big of a deal it was to a kid to be the the certain whatever they wanted to be. I think it's still that way. I'm sure it is, but now it's a lot easier. I think to buy costumes. Right. I think when you and I were kids, there was a lot of fashioning costumes. Uh huh. Uh, when you didn't have the ability to be like the alien from Alien, right. or you know, 
it was a lot harder to put together these elaborate costumes. My, um, but once you got your heart set on it, you like you had to. Sure. You know. So I'm going to tell you my best costume, and you tell me yours, okay? Uh, okay. Um, <laughs> my mom made one from uh-huh. scratch. Yeah. Clown, just a clown costume. Mm-hmm. But the big kicker was that it was an upside down clown walking on his hands. Mm-hmm. So my feet were the clown's hands. Yeah. His head is like dangling between my legs. <laughs> That's good. I've got his legs sticking up <laughs> off of my shoulders. And I don't remember. My head must have been covered up like I was in his butt or something like right. that. Right. But I was an upside down walking clown. Greatest costume ever. Really? Yeah. You got any pictures? Somewhere, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I did a lot of funny ones. Like my brother and I were Han Solo and Luke Skywalker when I was really little. Nice. Um, but then I got into like, I was always wanting to do like funny characters I like. Like I, like Ed Grimley one year, the Saturday Night Live <laughs> character. I did Ed Grimley one year. That's a good one. And I was, all, I don't know, I felt like I was always trying to make people laugh. I never did scary stuff. Right, until little kids started coming around and trick-or-treating at your house. <laughs> yes. So then you started to scare Or like movie characters. Mm-hmm. Like even into my adult years, you know, I would try and find some cool movie character like H.I. from Raising Arizona I did one year. Oh, that's, and, a good, that's almost Ed Grimley, same hair. Uh, no, not the same at all, <laughs> actually. <laughs> uh, and then one year I did a, a great, I actually won a contest in New Jersey one year when I was a, a Hare Krishna. And I like uh, shaved my head, I did the whole thing. Wow. I had literature I passed out. Wow. Made the whole the whole deal. You just ended up joining a local chapter for a little while. It was fine. <laughs> really got into the role, <laughs> but I haven't. It's been a few years since I've dressed up. Uh, yeah, same, same here. Because I just oh, that's not true. I haven't been. Last year. I haven't been to a Halloween party in probably five years. Right. What were you last year? I was um, Patrick Bateman from uh, American Psycho. Oh. So you were you, but with a tie. Right. Exactly. <laughs> and like a giant inflatable brick cell phone. Uh huh. And Yumi was a specific Michael Jackson, a moment of Michael Jackson's history where he's holding blanket over the balcony. Oh, sure. And Momo was blanket. <laughs> it's on. You can see it on Instagram. That's great. Yeah. I'll have to check that out. All right. So the candy company started getting involved. That's oh, where right. I left off. Yeah. Uh, because and the costume company. They knew it was gold for right. them. Uh, Mars uh, Incorporated in the early 1950s. We're doing ad campaigns on TV and in newspapers and on the radio and stuff about trick or treat. Um, it became a thing with UNICEF. Uh, they had a trick or treat for UNICEF campaign back then. I think they still might. You know, you know, what I'm talking about the little boxes I think that so. holds change. Yeah, and they would just give them to little kids, and while they were out trick or treating, they'd also ask for change for UNICEF, right, to help needy kids overseas. Yeah, and that actually went a really long way to legitimizing trick or treating. Yeah, they're doing a lot these days, too, for kids, special needs kids. Mm-hmm. Like, it's it's taken this long to finally get the word out. Uh, like the blue pumpkins, have you heard of those? No. If you trick-or-treat with a blue pumpkin, that means that you have some sort of special need where you may not be able to walk to a front door oh. and say, trick-or-treat, I'm dressed as, right. you know, Michigan J. Bullfrog. <laughs> what? <laughs> That'd be a great costume. It would be, but did you <laughs> pull that off of? Uh, I just made, yeah. Wow. Nice. He, he's been on my mind lately. I guess so. <laughs> but uh, so people know, like, oh, you've got a blue pumpkin, mm-hmm. so I shouldn't say, like, you know, come on, kid, why don't you tell me what your costume <laughs> is? Shake him. And uh, it's good, though. <laughs> like, the, it's taken – it's ironic that it's taken this long yeah. to get parents on board to the fact that some kids need, you know, different kinds of treatment. I don't know if ironic is the best word as much as disappointing is. Yeah. You know? You're probably right. <laughs> Should we take another break? Oh, my God. We're going to have to take three more. No, we're not. Okay, yes, we will then. Right, so I think basically what we were saying when we left off, and sorry about the, the nostalgia here, everybody, but I mean, come on. You get us in a room yeah. and around Halloween, it's going to happen. Um, so by the early 50s, uh, trick-or-treating was huge and established and had, so if the 1930 to 1960 was the heyday, mm-hmm. the golden age of trick-or-treating, 
1950 to 1959 was the salad days of the, the heyday. Right. And when did people start complaining about it? The 70s? No. And 80s? No. 90s? As far back as the 20s. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, because those newspaper articles that you can track the progress of Halloween, uh-huh. more often than not, they were like old cranks complaining about how they didn't want to have to give tricks or treats or whatever to little kids. Right. Don't they, you blackmail me. They don't. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, what are we teaching our kids? And there's actually, um, if you kind of scratch beneath the surface of trick-or-treating, at first it appears to be kind of a a weird power struggle between kids and adults. Mm -hmm. And it definitely is that. Yeah. But there's also uh, another power struggle going on between adults of two different minds. Mm -hmm. Ones who are like, you are over-parenting by being upset about this or like like this is just one night a year, it's good for kids. Mm -hmm. And other people are saying like, this is terrible for kids. Allowing them to go from house to house to beg is just a bad idea. It's unsafe is another way to put it too. So there's like a a struggle weirdly over trick-or-treating and it has to do with under-parenting and over-parenting and that conversation about the whole thing. I have seen parents ruin kids' experiences, uh, whether it's like a... uh, Easter egg hunt mm-hmm. or trick or treating. I've seen this in action. Because they're too involved? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's what it comes down to is just how involved are you in your kids' trick or treating? For a very brief period, there was very little involvement in kids' trick or treating. Yeah. Um, and a lot of people say that's actually really good for kids in this other way that we've kind of started to evolve toward yeah. is, is not. Yeah, I don't remember my parents taking me around trick-or-treating. I'm sure that happened maybe when I was really little, and we certainly would have had to go somewhere else because, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I lived on the— The (laughs) The the, dirt road? Yeah, the dirt road with no no neighbors, um, or very few of them. Uh But uh, I just—all of my memories stem from being like probably 10 to 15 Mm -hmm. and being completely on my own with my friends. 10 to 15? 10 years old. But to 15? That's yeah. pretty late. What, to trick-or-treat? Oh, yeah. Oh, now we trick-or-treated up until probably the like the ninth or 10th grade. Well, we'll get to it, but in some places you get to get arrested for that. <laughs> when did you stop? You'd still trick-or-treat if they would let you. <laughs> uh, I think I stopped around 13. No, well, maybe 15 was too late. Maybe 13 or 14. You're fine. No, 15's great. Go with God. <laughs> no, but you're you're probably right now that I look back. Maybe I went to Halloween parties, but maybe there's not a kind of an unofficial slash official again in some places um, cut, cut off. off after twelve. Really you're done? Yeah, because thirteen, you're a teenager now, and that's that's not kid stuff. As we'll see, it's uh, allegedly trick or treating is a transition from kidhood to adulthood, and by the time you're thirteen, you've you've made an, that transition. That's in your past. It's sad, but it's. I don't know why I'm talking like Christopher Walken all of a sudden, <laughs> but I am. Yeah, maybe I wasn't going that late, but I, I definitely remember going by myself at a certain point. But now with my neighborhood, it's just the I see mostly parents not involved at all. They're they're there, kind of like if your child is two or three, helping them walk to the door and stuff. Sure, but otherwise we're just drinking, and the kids are doing their thing. So let's talk about this then. Let's skip toward the end and we'll, we'll jump back, okay? All right. There is um, this debate over, you know, whether it's better to just kind of cross your fingers and, and hope for the best and let your kids go out and trick-or-treat on their own, mm-hmm. whether that's good mm-hmm. or whether we need to, um, the world's just too unsafe for that and we need to much more manage kids trick-or-treating than just letting them go out on their own. Well, it depends on where you are. That's the big divide. Yeah. And one of my personal heroes, the world's worst mom, Lenore Skenazy, uh-huh. who came up with the Free Range Kids blog right. and the whole movement, frankly, she makes this really great point that when we let kids trick-or-treat, we let them confront danger, like on their own. And it's real. It's a, just a thin, the narrowest margin of danger. I mean, people always talk about like the... Um, you know, all like the worst things that could happen on on Halloween when a kid's out trick or treating: getting hit by a car, getting kidnapped by a stranger, mm-hmm. getting like um, an apple like, with a razor blade in yes, it. Yes, just just stuff that happens, and mm-hmm. it can happen. It's true, but it happens so infrequently 
that the the chances are it's not going to happen, and you're actually better off just letting the kid roll the dice. Mm-hmm. Because as Lenore Skenazi puts it, when when you go trick-or-treating, you're transitioning from being a kid to a grown-up, mm-hmm. and you're doing this quite literally. Um, you go with your parents first, mm-hmm. and they kind of teach you the rules of the road, like sure. just take one piece of candy. Right. Or that house over there has their lights off, so don't leave them alone. Them. They don't want to have anything to do with this. Yeah. And then after that, you let them go on their own, right? And they, they kind of take the ball and roll with it. And she says that... Um, that when they're out trick or treating, kids dress like grown ups. Yeah. They take to the streets at night. They encounter the scariest possible locals, which is in goblins. Mm-hmm. And then, yes, they're doing it at the scariest possible time, night. And the whole thing is dress rehearsal for adulthood. Mm-hmm. And that, like, that's the benefit of trick or treating. I don't quite get that. The, that is the same as adulthood, like you and I all the time walking around at night fighting goblins and sure, witches. Sure, right, exactly. <laughs> Where would we have been without trick-or-treating to <laughs> okay. prepare us for fighting goblins? All right. But just confronting fears sure. on their own without their parents managing their world for them. Right. So that they can handle themselves, have the confidence to know they can handle themselves. Yeah. And, um, and, and I guess feel good about having confronted their fears and gotten candy in return. Let's not forget about that. Yeah. Now, on the other hand, it's just, just take the candy. It's fine. Right. Mommy and daddy made it perfect for you. All you have to do is go get the candy. <laughs> You're in a perfect bubble and everything's fine. Yeah. So that's, I kind of tend to fall on Lenore Skenazi's side on that. Well, should we talk a little bit about the... Um you know, whether or not there have been all these real horror stories over the years mm-hmm. and whether or not any of those are true yeah. as far as the razor blade and the apple and stuff like that, hypodermic needles and candy, um, this stuff doesn't happen. No, and the thing to point out, and I know we've talked about it before, is that it it was a an urban legend that yeah. came true. Right. Uh, there was one case, and this is actually kind of funny if you ask me. In 1959, there was a dentist in California named William Shine who uh, <laughs> took aloe laxative pills and disguised them as candy and gave out 450 of them what a jerk. to kids. <laughs> and they were all pooping, I guess. So I think a few of them did poop. Nobody got injured, though. Right. No, you're not going to get injured from a laxative. You could poop over poop. Over poop? <laughs> yeah. Uh, but this uh, is when I think this real story got out, and then all of a sudden it gets morphed into needles and razor blades or poison or uh, candy laced with heroin and stuff like that. Well, that did happen. Well, yeah, but th- that's the thing. Like the examples that are listed are reverse engineered almost. Right, right. So there was a little boy in Texas who died from eating a cyanide um, laced pixie stick right in Texas in I can't remember what year it 74. was 74 and um, it turned out that it was his dad that his dad was the scum of the earth who had taking out, taken out insurance policies on his own children good lord and then gave them spiked Halloween candy to make it look like some mad poisoner had killed his kids so he could collect insurance and one of his kids did die but it was it wasn't just some random Halloween right. poisoner. That guy didn't really exist at the time. Yeah, 1970 in Detroit was the heroin incident. Um, this kid uh, overdosed. These kids ate their uncle's stash. Is what really happened. Right. And then that uncle was like, "Oh crap! Right. Let me sprinkle the heroin on the candy and cook up the story." Yeah. And maybe cook up some heroin. <laughs> right. <laughs> Since I'm cooking. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, to try and get out of this. So, again, it really happened, but not in the way that you think. No. Um, the thing that got everybody, so that William Shine guy, who I just think is a skell for that, because he, he scared the pants off of America's parents. Yeah. He basically said, hey, hey, you know how you're letting your kids run free? Something really bad could happen to him, and I just showed you how. Yeah. And from the, the, the next year on, the parents were anxiously involved in Halloween like they never had been before. Sure. Because of William Shine. But, um... The uh, the the thing that really killed Halloween, or at least cemented, I think, the anxieties in the heads of parents in America, is that Tylenol poisoner. Oh, sure. Canceled Halloween 1982. Did it really? Almost drove Ben Cooper uh, costumes out of business. Candy sales went down 50%. I trick-or-treated in 1982. Well, your parents didn't love you. <laughs> I think I did, too. I don't remember not... I, I would no. remember not trick-or-treating one year. Yeah, because I would have been 11. That's prime time. Right. Th- apparently, those are the retirement years. But all of this stuff 
added a veneer of fear and anxiety on trick-or-treating for parents, not for kids necessarily, but for parents. Yeah. And it drew them in to what was possibly just a kid-run activity because of fear, probably irrational fear. Yeah. And now you have, to this day, the FDA sending out guidelines around Halloween saying, don't let your kids eat any candy until they bring it home. Right. Which is just torture. Yeah. And you have to inspect it. And if you see any pinholes or tears or anything that looks weird, just throw it away. Some hospitals say, bring your kids candy and we'll x-ray it yeah. to see if there's any razor blades or needles in it or something like that. This is the kind of terror that ironically is overlaid on Halloween. It's like fun terror has actual real terror on top of it, which makes it less fun. We don't inspect candy. Oh, you don't? You roll the dice, huh? Yeah. That's great. I don't know anyone who does. Really? No. Oh, man, I was raised like that. You inspected candy. Oh, yeah, my parents were serious about it. We never did. I don't know. I just, I don't know. That's maybe, great. Man. Maybe it's that thing of like, if you're the, because uh, it doesn't happen. Right. I'm No, I'm heartened to hear that. Yeah. Because I when we did our Free Range Kids episode, I remember thinking like, what? This, what's going on now? Like, like kids are treated like this? They're not kids allowed to Kids are being poisoned free? by Halloween candy. <laughs> right. It's just not happening. Right. You know? Yeah. Plus, in our neighborhood with the sanctioned closure, all the candy is, people aren't buying their own candy. It's like the neighborhood buys all the candy and they congregated in these couple of blocks. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Okay. I mean, there could be a, a madman living among us. It happens. But that's like being scared to walk out your front door for fear of being murdered. Right. Right, Chuck. You know? You just can't live that way. You can't live that way. You know, Yumi told me a story about um, a village, like villages in Japan have like a festival or two every year. Uh -huh. where, like the whole community comes out. It's like a big deal. And there was one village, a little tiny town, where um, this one woman just, I guess, went mad and poisoned the curry that she brought to the village thing and like, oh, wow. killed a bunch of townspeople. It happens. It does happen, but you're right. You can't not eat the curry just because of the small, small chance that some mad person has poisoned it. Yeah, the way I look at it is if that's what happens, then that's, you know. Your number's up. Your number's up and you're a, a story in the newspaper. <laughs> Right. <laughs> to scare other people. Sure. You get to be immortalized on stuff you should know. Is trick-or-treat going away, Josh? I don't know, Chuck. I say no. Okay, that's good. I'm glad to hear that because, again, I'm living hashtag condo life. I'm out of the action. Yeah, I, I mean, there's this the last bit of this article you sent talked about it um, going away potentially, but I just I don't think that's ever, ever going to happen. So what are your arguments for it going away that it might my arguments, or your, you these know, are my observations. Your observations. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the big ones is that fear among parents that helicopter parenting has not been good for trick or treating. Ah. Okay. Okay. But but think about it. That's a real struggle going on right now. Over parenting versus under parenting. Mm -hmm. Which one's going to win out? Right. Okay. Um, another one is there's a perception that that trick or treating is dying out, which is kind of funny. Is there? Yes, because. People are moving back into towns and gentrifying those towns, like uh, we talked about in the historic district episode. Mm -hmm. um, and as they're doing that, uh, trick or treating was never huge in the city, and so people who were raised in the suburbs and or were used to it are moving into the city, and there's no trick or treating going on anymore. So I guess trick or treating's dying because that's what I'm seeing. I, I differ. I beg to differ with that too. Okay, but I mean, you don't live in the city, city. You live in a neighborhood. Yeah, but that's all Atlanta is, is a bunch of neighborhoods. Okay. You mean I don't live downtown? Maybe these people live in Des Moines. <laughs> I don't know. No one lives in downtown Atlanta. No, it's true. <laughs> Although it has gotten cooler than it was like a decade ago. Sure. Uh, but I, I beg to differ that trick-or-treating doesn't go on in the cities. I think I think there are apartment buildings in New York where people trick-or-treat. Mm -hmm. Like just because it's not the picket fence suburban neighborhood – Sure. Uh, I think trick-or-treating goes on everywhere. But this author, Except my house. Julie Beck, who wrote in The Atlantic, she put it really well that, that basically the suburbs and trick-or-treating 
just go hand in hand. Sure. Like the suburbs are set up for trick or treat. Oh yeah. You got houses that are close together. Super safe. Um, yep. Where people who live there are just well enough off to yeah. to buy enough candy for the whole neighborhood. Yeah. Um, they all have kids. They know each other enough that you're not embarrassed for your kid to go up and trick or treat there, mm-hmm. and you know that it's, this candy is not going to be poisoned. In the city, you're much um, more. Uh, isolated from one another, even though you're living on top of one another. Yeah, and I think maybe if if we're talking about, like, uh, areas where there are poor kids and where poverty is run rampant, mm-hmm. then maybe there's less traditional trick-or-treating, but there are programs and parties and things they try to do for those kids, too. Okay, so those very things may end up being what kills trick-or-treating. The, the, I should say the purest version of trick-or-treating. You can also just make the case, well, that's what it's evolving into and just go with it. I think there will probably around. be both, but you're talking about the big Halloween parties, community parties, trunk-or-treating. Trunk-or-treating in particular. Or uh, what was it called? Halloween. Uh, tailgating. Halloween tailgating. Trunk-or-treating. This is the idea that you – and we had this at our school. We had the Halloween festival. But that did not replace trick or treating. Okay, this replaces trick or treating for right. a lot of children. Yeah, so you you go out and you get in a big church parking lot, essentially. Yep. And you have uh, Bob and Frapples and the dunk tank. Oh, this is different. And huh? This is a little different than that. <laughs> well, I mean, I've seen these in person, and uh, okay, but that's a Halloween festival you're talking about. No, no, no. I'm talking about instead of trick or treating. Okay. It's a big party. Okay. Where they have candy and they have activities and games and stuff. So are you going from car to car getting candy? Like the cars or houses? Uh, no, not necessarily, but they're giving out candy. I mean, I can't. My friend, feels, you're not talking about trunk or treat. It feels very nitpicky to me. No, but it's not, and here's why. I'm not talking about a Halloween festival, though. I'm, okay, I'm, that's fine, that's fine. I'm, but I'm you're not talking, talking about trunk or treating either. <laughs> You mean you walk five feet to a car yes. and they give you candy, then five feet to another car? Maybe even less than five. And they say, don't play any games, don't bob for apples, or don't do anything else. All you're doing is walking to cars. I'm not <laughs> saying that they don't have bobbing for apples, but the, the purpose of tr- trunk or treating is to basically set up a safe ring of cars where the kids are literally penned in. Yeah. The kids who used to be the ones who were running the show are now penned in by the anxious adults' cars handing out candy rather than going to houses, walking right. around a church parking lot for trunk or treating instead of trick or treating. Yes. I These get are that. not the kids who could pull but that off. That's not going to replace trick or treating. What the kids in the Goonies did, were able to pull off yeah. because they had freedom and spark that kids who trunk or treat are being denied. Right. That as, let me go back to my friend Lenore Skenazi. She <laughs> says that trunk or treating is just another adult led activity. One that reinforces the community killing idea that kids aren't ever safe outside the home, school, or supervised program. And that is most definitely the the message that kids get when they're trunk or treating. Yeah, I think that is not going to kill trick or treating or take over trick or treating. We'll see, Chuck. I hope you're right. Because one thing I have not seen since I've lived in Atlanta is any big trunk or treating activities. Well, that's because you live in Atlanta. All you have to do is go out to the suburbs and they're everywhere. Yeah, but the suburbs are made for trick-or-treating. They're out in the neighborhoods. I got to end on a quote. <laughs> I ran across a uh, a um, website, a, I guess a church website, that's talking about trunk-or-treating. It's awesome, this quote. It says that the scariest part about the night, this is a trunk-or-treating night, mm-hmm. isn't the costumes. It's the possibility that you could miss out on the chance to use trunk-or-treat to build relationships and reach these kids with the gospel. <laughs> well, yeah. That is the opposite of what Halloween is all about. That's right. Um, you got anything else? It's about arson. <laughs> right, 810 <laughs> cases of it. Sorry, I'm one of those curmudgeons, it turns out. Uh, one more thing. Yes. If you like Halloween, go on to our old Stuff You Should Know website and search Halloween and Creepy. And you're going to find some amazing slideshows we put together over the years. Oh, that's right. I remember those. One of my favorite is um, cute and cruddy Halloween costumes, mm-hmm. vintage Halloween costumes that were really creepy, mm-hmm. uh, best jack-o'-lanterns, all sorts of great stuff. Remember those days where we would count page views and get excited about that? Mm-hmm, yeah. This one felt like a bit of a tirade. Yeah? Was it? I don't think so. Okay, good. Well, if you want to know more about Halloween, get out there and trick-or-treat. And since I said that, it's time for Listener Mail. Uh, This is follow-up on paraphilias uh, that we wanted to read 
for the last few weeks. Just now getting to it. Hey guys, long time listener, first time writer. Uh, I've had this episode pop up a few times. And it's just been on my mind. I'm an RN with MSN and background uh, and have background in neurophysiology who enjoys studying abnormal psych. I understand you were doing a show on psychological term on a psychological term, uh, but you may have ended up painting wrong ideas onto certain practices, oh, specifically S and M and cross dressing. Um, from what I've come to know, it's extremely rare that people practice these primarily for sexual gratification. Of course, these practices are adult in nature, but most regard it as an emotional practice or exploration of self. For example, uh, shibari or rope bondage takes hundreds of hours of practice to perform, and those that partake describe a meditation-like state as a result, though most would say it's s and uh, Most cross-dressers describe the long process of becoming female as cathartic and self-affirming, although be it uh, temporary. Uh, simplifying cross-dressers to those who walk around in high heels to reach completion, well, imagine saying that about a trans woman. Of course, if you were doing these practices for sexual gratification, all the power to you. Uh, I suggest you look into kink culture as an episode. It's where a wide range of people congregate and share their interest in a community that is founded off respect and consent. There are meetups and presentations on practices so that others can learn proper technique, uh, though most that practice would like to keep their privacy. And that is from Anonymous. Thanks a lot, Anonymous. That was a good correction email. That's right. Yep. Uh, if you want to get in touch with us like Anonymous did to set us straight, we love that kind of thing. You can uh, join us at stuffyoushouldknow.com and check out our social links there. And you can send us an email to stuffpodcast at iheartradio.com. Stuff You Should Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.